Hi guys, I'm Nick Rossos. I'm Andrew Steinberg. Welcome to another episode of Half the Ball to Talk About It. Welcome on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Steinberg. You look a little different than last oh, yeah, time we worked together. Oh yeah, I almost actually. Look a bit be better now. <laughs> yeah. So today we're going to talk about um, what are the top five questions that people ask a sex therapist. That's really good because I have a question right away. Do you? Yeah. What's the like? Uh, how many hours per day I can watch porn? <laughs> Well, okay. I, what the hell are you guys doing here? Oh, what are you guys doing? Get out of my chair, guys. Give me that show. Just have the, the camera. Stop oh. talking about porn all the time. Oh my god. Sorry about that, guys. Whew. Sorry, Dr. Fishman. Hi, guys. I'm Nick. No, you're Nick. Yeah. <laughs> He's Nick Drosos, I'm Dr. Andrew Steinberg, and we have with us Dr. Sarah Fishman and another episode of Have the Balls to Talk About It. So uh, Sarah was with us on a previous episode and we wanted to, to bring her back to discuss um, some of the top five questions that she gets from, from patients. Definitely. So I think one of the first top five is, am I normal? Are we normal? Whatever it is that we're experiencing, we have a need to know if this is normal. We're like consumed with, do we meet normative expectations? And Emily Nagoski, who's this author of a fabulous book that I would recommend come, called Come As You Are, um, in one of her TED Talks says, in every other area of her life, we're more consumed with being unique, mm. with going above, with That's being true. exemplary, you mm. know, with trying to exceed expectations. But when it comes to sex and performance, it's all about, am I normal? And I think that normal is very relative to the couple. It's normal if it's good for both of you. Makes sense. It's a good one. Question number two. Is it normal that I experience pain during intercourse? So unequivocally, unequivocally the answer is no. It is never normal. And I think you, get, you probably get this mm. as well. Yeah. You know, pain with um, intercourse. There should not be pain. Sure. Sure. Intercourse. This is from a women's perspective, or well, even a man. Yeah. We get, there's a lot of painful yeah. issues that men get during sex, also. Right. Erroneous disease and, and pride. And so. Right. The idea is really that there should not be pain during intercourse, and we should really look at it from a multidisciplinary perspective in terms of what's contributing to the pain. So if it's medical, then we have a team to send you to. But you know, with all kind of pain, there's always the fear of pain, and that's the psychological aspects of it that we can address. And the pelvic floor therapists contribute to the treatment of this as well. Question number three, am I watching too much porn? Debbie? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so that, that's, how does, how does porn affect like, uh, like someone's brain Sorry. or their illusion of sex? Yeah, and is any amount of porn healthy? healthy? Yeah. Well, look, the question to am I watching too much porn, the answer to that is really, is it interfering with aspects of your life? So meaning, are you at a dinner and you need to run off somewhere and, you know, kind of go on your phone? That's too much. Right. Are you, you know, with your partner and that's not enough, you really need to, you know, kind of remove yourself from the situation, go watch some porn and then come back, right? So then you have the answer that, you know, what's happening here is really expectations that aren't met, whether it's your own expectations from watching the porn or whether it's, you know, expectations about what sex should be like, which is a little bit about what we talked about in the previous episodes, but that's when you know that the answer is, um, yeah. And that goes for both sides, I'm assuming, Absolutely. right? Because we have the idea that it's mostly men who watch porn. Is, do women watch porn? Is this women watch porn. In fact, there's a rise in the last number of years um, on more women-centered, you know, porn and also on just um, erotica materials for women, um, you know, Fifty Shades kind of. Oh, it's true, huh? Fifty Shades of Rain. Brought this, that this, out. This type of movie. Kind of soft porn? No? Yeah, erotica. Yeah. So that's one of the questions. Um, another good we question. We should do an episode on Fifty Shades of Drosso. <laughs> How long is that episode going to be? <laughs> um, it's going to be Fifty Shades of Red now. <laughs> Another good question is, how do I spice things up with my partner? That's a good one. You know, especially in long-term relationships, when you can get a lot of if-thens, 
Mm -hmm. You know, if I don't do this, then this doesn't happen. Um, you know, couples come in and they can be in good, stable relationships, but they find that things have a lot of structure. And one of the things that we do is we try and remove that structure a little bit, try and take away the if-thens, you know? Mm -hmm. And that leads to one of the biggest, I think, ideas out there that, you know, it used to be that when we looked at the sexual response cycle, it was this kind of bell-shaped curve, right? And you start with desire, then you go to arousal, climax, and what's called the refractory period when everything goes back to baseline. And it led to this idea that you have to start with desire, move its way up to arousal, end with climax, and then, you know, start all over again. And what that perpetuates is really this idea that something's wrong with me if I have low libido, if I have low desire. And what research has shown, really, is that you can start with arousal, and that contributes to desire. Mm. So it's not so linear, but, you know, the idea that just do it sometimes, and then you can start feeling it, actually applies to both men and women. You find, like, people in long-term relationships, when that starts to go away, do you, do you find it's, is it, again, is it normal, not normal? Is it because people get comfortable or used to it, and they need to spice it up, or they get bored? Do you see that? Yeah, you don't want it to become routine sex. Right. So I think dry spells are not, dry spells are sometimes inevitable. And that's no, okay. That's okay. You know, you've got little kids, you've got a lot of, you know, you've got a house that's busy, you have to like plan it, and then you realize both of you are exhausted and all you're thinking about is just getting good night's sleep. Dry spells are normal, and I think you need to start taking away the taboo around that. Sometimes people need to work a little bit harder in long-term yeah. relationships, but I think that has to do with talking about it more. You know, that really comes down to being able to talk about it. Should we break out into song now? Let's talk about sex. <laughs> um, and lastly, the fifth question is, is my dysfunction psychological or medical? And people really want to know that. Yeah. You know, they get stuck on what is the one cause to my sexual dysfunction. Yeah, I get that all the time. Right? All the time. And it's just... Why, why, why? What, what, you know, like, what like, is it? Like it's there, there's one thing that's going to say, oh, that's why I have erectile dysfunction. Right. And that's just rarely the case, yeah. you know? Sometimes... It's consuming to some patients. It's consuming. And sometimes they want that medical cause. It's just this relief that if there's a medical cause, then surely there's an immediate fix, that, yeah. you know? And then sometimes, you know what? As a sex therapist, you really need to look at it from a multidisciplinary perspective. And when you're looking for a sex therapist, you want someone who's gonna be speaking with your urologist, who's going to be, you know, just kind of working as a team. Because sometimes, I mean, you and I speak about this all the time, you know, sometimes a person's man's so anxious mm -hmm. that a little bit of Cialis is just gonna bring down that anxiety so that you can work on all of the contributing factors around the anxiety and the performance aspect of it. And sometimes there is a medical cause and we need to look at, you know, the psychological aspects that are contributing to it. But very rarely does one occur in the absence of the other. They're always both. Intertwined. And, and treating both is the best way to success. Definitely. 100%. That's where you really want a multidisciplinary. Yep. So when a patient comes here, you guys, you'll, they'll work with you and you'll send them? Often, the, yeah, often on, on the gateway, they usually come through me. Uh, some patients will be referred directly or, or will find uh, Sarah and go directly to her. But most of the time, I, all the time, I try to, I, you know, along with discussing, discussing all the other options out there, Viagra and this and that and nutritional advice and so on, you know, you, you should see a sex therapist and they can help you. And, no, oh, I'm okay, I'm okay, it's, it's not in my mind, it's something happening here. Or I give them the consultation and, and you know, inevitably they don't end up going see her. I, I would say out of, uh, out of 20 patients I see with erectile dysfunction, maybe four agree to go to a sex therapist wow. and maybe half of those don't even show up. Wow. And There's it's, a very it's a high attrition rate. Yeah. Uh, Is it because men are afraid to open up about it or even look at, the, talk about didn't. the problem or denial? It's probably different I reasons. think people just need to sit with it for a little bit, yeah, okay. you know? Like, just seeking psychological help, you have to kind of get yourself to a place where you want to do that. So, too, with any sort of sexual issues, you need to kind of, you know, prepare for it, even look it up and look up the therapist and what am I going to be, who am I going to be meeting, what am I going to talk about, you know? So if you go on my website, I have a whole section on what are you going to actually be talking about that first session. What is your website? It's www.dr for drsarahfishman.com. And one of the things that I aim to do through that website is to just reduce that anxiety that people have about yeah. seeking help. So I tell them what to expect. Which uh, brings me to another uh, lead. Um, 
Thank you. Those were amazing uh, to hear the Thank questions, you. but also the answers. But you said you had some good books that you wanted to... I uh, do. So I often recommend two books. One is Bernie Zilbergeld's book, New Male Sexuality, which is a fabulous book for men, for women also, but really, really an excellent book for men. Um, he passed away a number of years ago, but his book remains a staple that I recommend to everybody. What, what can people read about him? It's just overall just sexual. They can hear about the fantasy model of sex that we talked about. They can hear about performance anxiety. They hear about techniques. They hear about men's needs. They talk about resolving problems, expressing yourself, what are common contributors to sexual dysfunction, the whole idea that we talked about of how does the media contribute to myths and expectations. So this is a great book that I like to recommend. And then this is another book that I like to recommend for women called Come As You Are by Emily Nagoski, which is really a great book on female sexuality. Amazing. Awesome. There you have it. Five questions uh, most asked to a sex therapist and great answers to that. Yeah. So um, thank you, Sarah, for coming Thanks back. Thanks for having thank me. You, this Sarah. was fun. Yeah. And uh, don't be afraid to seek help. Don't be afraid to speak to your doctors, your therapists, your, your friends, your spouse, everybody. Uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. Yes. Have the balls to talk about it. Have the balls to talk about it. I have another question. <laughs> <laughs> At what's the limit of like, watching porn? <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha